add the contribu add the contribution range from information retrieval to digital libraries uh, for of which uh, he was one of the fathers uh, and and also uh, machine learning uh, user interaction and so it's it's my great pleasure uh, to thank him for for accepting our invitation and uh, we look forward to to listen to your uh, talk thank you thank you very much thank you and i'm going to share my screen i think and see how these things work can people see the slide is that okay yes it is okay so it's a great honor to be here this is a wonderful group um, I'm one of these um, synergistic people that <laughs> likes to tie things together. And this is one of the delightful events that, um, that focuses on that. Um, so too much on this slide, but <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> the line here in the middle is the um, address of the talk. So you can get to this. There's also a PDF version of this and I'm easy to reach. If you want to send me mail, there's a website. Um, there's lots of other talks. If you just strip off this last part, you can see many years worth of things. Um, so we're gonna talk about discovery and exploration and about digital libraries in their past and their future. So let's go. First of all, I have to thank so many people. Um, now you see there's one person here about two thirds down whose name is in bold. Uh, Uma is here in the group. So. Uh, Welcome Uma, um, she worked with me on her doctoral studies and uh, did delightful um, activities uh, dealing with uh, fish species identification. And there's a, a team that's doing some newer work on this I'm involved in now that I believe is going to be in the Mediterranean sometime this summer with drones trying to track and tag uh, sharks uh, that we're trying to figure out how to classify. So. Um, her work is getting continued in, in a new vein, which is uh, quite exciting. But thanks to mentors and collaborators and sponsors and, and so on. So thanks. Um, just to give a little bit of perspective, I think I may be the old timer in the group today. Um, I've been a member of ACM since 1967. <laughs> um, and, and there's a bunch of links to this. So I, I represent a number of different perspectives um, and you'll hear more of those as we go along, but, but I put some dates and some activities and um, my most recent venture is I'm a chief technology officer for, of the startup. Um, so um, the National Science Foundation has an innovation core because they want our technology to be put into practice. So the short version of the talk today um, is shown with these small number of bullets. Um, the first one is uh, exploration is a fundamental human need. So uh, this group is dealing with something that has a, a really firm foundation and importance in the world. Um, it's important for all the societies of the world. And I include not only humans, but also computers as we move more into uh, autonomous vehicles and, and AI and, and robotics and all these kinds of things. Um, and they interact by way of many different kinds of scenarios. Um, which sometimes people think of as, as services. In the physical world, which is a spatial context, and there are also mathematical versions of that, we try to organize things or build structures. And underneath all of this are streams of information. So um, that's one of the themes of this is, is these five things that start with S. I, I like the number five, it's an important number. So we're gonna try and move today from, um, how do we go from theory to design to building to development and operations, or, or as the software engineering world calls it, DevOps. Um, and to do that effectively, we have to integrate lots of things. And, and some of them are sciences, you know, computing science, computer sciences, library science, information science, and then all these other things. And, and there's many things we have to tie together. So this is a wonderful group to, uh, to try to do that. And that's what the talk's about, to, to push these points. So going back a ways, um, we're at the end, well, not at the end. Um, I guess we're in the Anthropocene right now. Um, we're in the world's history that has gone on for about 14 billion years <clears throat> on earth, you know, four or five. Um, and 
we're sort of following in all these and it's a delightful book uh, I, I gave a note at the bottom of this page that uh, if you want to just have a good history of everything uh, that's a nice book to start with but in the context of what we're talking about we should we should use um, a method that's common in Asian countries not so much in the west unfortunately um, and think of things in cycles so exploration includes many things and they come back together in this big kind of circle of needs and sources and searching and use and more needs and more and so on. So research is all about this and exploration um, is the broader sense than uh, simple research. And um, Ryan White, who's well known in the IR field, certainly now and, and, and others have done a delightful uh, small book on exploratory search. And as you know, the, the, uh, this community deals with many of those particular aspects. So here's the outline of what we'll talk about today. Um, somewhat short and I'm gonna dive in. The first two things I'm gonna kind of merge together. Uh, I was very fortunate, uh, one of these um, whimsical serendipity things as I was an undergraduate at MIT, my advisor was JCR Licklider, um, who's um, well known for people in the community and, and these are some of the things you know in some sense he's a founder of hci uh, some sense of the founder of of the internet and the arpanet and, and so forth and, and these are a few things and i'll say a little bit more um so some people call him the grandfather of the internet because when he was at uh, arpa he gave the funding to the initial projects but i knew him as director of project mac which politically incorrect now uh, was man and computer um, and that was the early days of time sharing and of Multics, which is the precursor of Unix, the precursor of Linux and so on. Uh, a very famous AI lab with uh, great people there, Papert and Minsky and, and others. Uh, there's a nice biography about him that uh, came out a few years ago and, and it talks about many of his contributions. So one of the books he wrote is called Libraries of the Future. This came out in 1965 um, and Speaking about libraries, he has a, a quote here about books and how we would move things forward. But um, you know, he really began this HCI field and, and, and many other kinds of things. Um, so that book has uh, inspired me. Um, and in that book, um, which he prepared for the Council on Library Resources, um, he proposed a lot of things that people and computers would work, work together, that we would deal with knowledge and analysis methods and we would bring together information retrieval and natural language processing that the systems would become self-organized and adaptive uh, we see a lot of these things um, and one of the nice things he said is we should bring together underlying mathematical approaches and theories and there's a bunch of those at the bottom that need to be leveraged to bring this so at the end of the book he had this challenge um, we need a way to deal with language. Um, we need to understand um, how to use formal methods um, in order to solve some of these challenges. And at that point, um, he didn't see a way that we would be able to have underlying formalism um, for representing and for building systems and explaining the things that we talk about. So I've taken that as a challenge for a long time. Uh, can we? Can we solve this problem? Can we address this? So that leads us to 5S, which some of you may know, but maybe some not. And so I need to uh, beat the drum a little bit. Um, many fields of endeavor, many fields of computer science um, have benefited from some kind of formal uh, thinking, formal theoretical approach, formal representations. Um, and so the database world, the information retrieval world, the programming language world, many fields have benefited uh, in that in the world of computer science. And we see it in many other endeavors. Uh, one of the benefits of having some formal approach is, is that they can be the basis for construction for building things, which nowadays in the world of digital libraries still and more broadly in information systems um, are, are largely ad hoc. Um, and they're not really well organized which calls for large numbers of people. We always have a, a shortage of people to, uh, to function in these things. But if we can understand conceptually and understand the requirements, and then we can build things. Um, and so I spoke about this a number of times in the last 15 years, uh, in a talk in, in Beijing in 2004, um, and representing some case studies that dealt with this. 
fortunately, they are through Morgan and Claypool, which many places have subscriptions to, uh, four books from 2012, 2014. The first was uh, a book setting together the foundations for this. The second was addressing key issues, integration and evaluation. Um, and I was very fortunate to have great co-authors um, in these particular uh, works as well as in the other ones. Oh, and by the way, the chapter two of the first book talks about exploration, which is, um, and then gives a more formal approach in appendix D2. Uh, they're fairly short books, so they're not too bad, but, uh, but there's a lot of stuff in them. And then books three and four, um, what are the technologies? And then what are the applications, uh, some of them? And we're continuing to, to build on this and, and so on. And many thanks to Gary Marcinini, the series editor for this, and for Morgan Claypool to help disseminate some of these. So I encourage you to take a look there. They should be free to most people. Uh, there's small books. And so I think together they capture uh, a lot of useful things. So the simple version of 5S is five things that begin with the letter S. And you can see them in parentheses here with sort of short sentences around them to turn it into the whole thing as, a, as one might read a concept map, um, as tying together this into a, a long sentence, uh, which I won't read, but uh, the slides will be available. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail as, as we proceed. So we can define them in a fairly simple way. Here's the list on the left and some simple mathematical definitions. So the nice thing is they're intuitive, but yet we can be very formal mathematically and define them with uh, clear definitions and notations. And then we can use them for many different purposes. So here we see some examples of each of those S's and we see objectives, what we can do with them. Um, now in the top right, for those who have uh, some familiarity with this, uh, five, as I said, is a good number. I've done a lot of study of traditional Chinese medicine. Um, these are the five elements with, uh, I think, the right symbols and so forth. And you'll see them along the way. So you can try to map uh, the, these five things to, to the uh, five elements from uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Um, so long history of, of these as basic concepts and constructs. Now, they don't have to be considered only by themselves. They can be combined in different forms. So if you think about a book or a document, it has a multiple linear structures, a page structure, a, se a sequence of pages, a sequence of words. <clears throat> and then we can try to impose some kind of structure on top of those streams. So a document in this general sense, viewed from a hierarchical perspective and from a stream perspective, in other words, from a structure and a stream perspective, is a structured stream. Um, in some recent work, which I'll get to towards the end, we can even take uh, <clears throat> code and scenarios and treat them as um, structured scenarios as structured streams, uh, which is a, a newer twist to combine each of these different things. Now, if you take these five S's, you'll see they're sort of in the middle of this slide. Above are the simple mathematical constructs that are well understood in, in, in math and in set theory and so on. You can take each of those things, combine them together, and you can define the five S's. Then you can use those five S's to define all the things that are below. This is very common in computer science and in other forms of abstraction, where we try to layer things. You know, have a, an underlying layer of math, a middle layer of the five S's, and then the upper level of of all that we're doing in digital libraries. And I argue this works really for other systems, uh, for information systems of all kinds. And the concept here is to define what's the minimal thing? What, what's the least that uh, we have to have in order to call it a digital library? So these 38 definitions capture all the key ideas relating to uh, basic issues of digital libraries. Um, now, some of those have to do with um, Scenarios, scenarios assign and relate to services, and that's also well defined. When we are building these kinds of systems, we have sort of two, two pieces to the whole thing. We have the infrastructure uh, building piece shown on the left side and the user satisfaction side on the right. And we see some of the constructs that are defined previously and how they're related to each other and how they tie together. And, and they are closely interconnected. We can't have the stuff on the right. We can't help people unless we build some things on the left. 
And so that's why we, we try to build these systems. Another way to, to cut these in terms of the things we're familiar with, um, you see a, a line across from the bottom left to the top right. Sort of on the left side are the streams and the spaces, which are really the basic constructs that we consider when we talk about content. Um, and on the right side um, are the, the human and the operational activities, the societies and the scenarios. You know, what do we do with this? And you can see relationships in, in this kind of ontological representation. So that's 5S in short, lots more to dig into, but how do we use this to build digital libraries? Well, I've alluded to this notion of infrastructure services and information satisfaction services. We can get more detailed and here is a taxonomic structure that shows how we can divide up most kinds of information systems into um, infrastructure that's partly involved in building things, which is partly done by creating and then having a preservation aspect. How do we add value to those things? And then with all that in place, how do we help people um, and different societies accommodate their needs? So given all this, one of the things that we did was, okay, let's use this to build systems. Um, and one of the simple interfaces we built is shown here in terms of a workspace on the bottom or a toolbox on the bottom. So you pick a model, what kind of digital library do you want? Um, and and you can see the, the middle part of the bottom has the five S's and we can expand any one of those pieces, the structure piece, for example, and that deals with the, the collection, the catalog and the organizational tools. That's sort of key pieces for that. And then if you wanna build a particular digital library in the top, you start instantiating from the model and giving more details. So this is in keeping with a very popular effort these days of doing no code development or, or low code development. And there's a, a quote at the bottom of how important um, this movement is and, and I've seen how effective it can be. So given a tool like that, and that's 5S graph in the top center of this diagram. Um, so with that kind of tool, uh, a digital library designer in the top right will pick a particular meta model for a class of digital libraries that has been constructed by a digital library expert. They'll use this tool to construct the description of the digital library, it'll go into a generator, which will make use of a pool of components that will generate a, a particular digital library that can be used by many different kinds of personas. So we've done this, we built this, uh, multiple versions of this using DSpace and, and other kinds of environments. So with a formal basis, you can simplify the construction and the development and, and organization of these kinds of systems. So given such things, how does this tie into exploration? So I'm gonna remind us about this, this wheel. Um, Christine Borgman ran a wonderful workshop um, a long time ago um, and I've abstracted it and added more details and done this in collaboration with a number of other people. You can see sort of the four basic pieces and then a, another loop around some of the, the activities we carry out around that, the, the ways we evaluate each of those things and on the very outer part, sort of organizing this into different phases. Um, we often think of exploring as limited to only parts of this cycle, but why not have it fit in with everything? It, it certainly can be. So again, in a talk some years ago, and, and wanna thank um, this great group of people I collaborated with, um, we looked at this notion of exploring um, and we looked at what it is um, and we ask some research questions. Uh, how do these different concepts that we talk about, browsing and searching and visualizing, how do these things connect? Can we formally consider those things? Um, and so here you see this um, the five elements again on the left. So within that, that particular framework, um, can we build general exploring services that tie together browsing, searching, visualizing, and sort of data science type of things like clustering? Um, given that, can we do some proofs? And so you know, then I spoke of, and, and in those books I mentioned before, uh, we have theorems and we have lemmas and they touch on these different kinds of things. And, and the short version is that searching, browsing and visualization especially are really the same thing. They're all part of exploration. They can be mapped from one to the other in different kinds of ways. Um, so I won't go into the detail on that, but um, we then use that to build a system to help archeologists so they could carry out a number of tasks that you see listed on, on the bottom here. 
And we did a, a user evaluation and had high rankings um, in terms of the usability of the system that came out of this process. So uh, the short version of this is that we can use this kind of theory to, to move forward and to um, build systems and make them usable and, and so on. So let's go into the, the final section of this. Uh, um, this is a short talk, so I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up pretty soon. Um, how do we work towards the future? So I, I argue for a, a seven step process. And, and you see here, uh, data science, information science, HCI, UX, IR. So I'm trying to tie this together for the, the purpose of this particular workshop, because I think this group is the one that needs to figure out how to make all this stuff work. So to build these systems, we need to collect information that will be suitable for data science and decision science and data analytics. We need to, through information science methods, curate and archive those things. So we'll keep them around, we'll be able to organize them and work with them. We, we need to let um, data scientists do their analysis, text analysis, data analysis, combinations of those kinds of things, predictions from those. We need to discover the personas um, and if in a, in a commercial setting, the customers, um, which is part of where the HCI world comes into. Then comes a crucial phase, which most people have missed and we've been focusing on in, in our recent work. How do we tie together the user experience, the subject matter expert and the DevOps people who are building and, and operating these things using knowledge representations that can help us build dynamic systems that will solve people's information needs. So this is back to the IR side. And can we make these systems um, be semi-automatic in a way that engages these people um, and yet allows the system to continuously improve and to better meet the needs and goals of people. So here's a picture from the doctoral work of Prashant Chandrasekhar. Um, and there's a few papers and stuff I'll mention on this. You know, we have this broad view of a digital library or information system that's made of sort of two digital libraries. The one on the left is, is supporting the user experience activities, collecting artifacts, managing those artifacts. The one on the right is the system that people are making use of with representations that come from the analysis from this. In the middle, we have this you know, semiotic pro process, automatic process where we tie these people together to um, help connect things in a knowledge representation. And then we use workflow managers and services registries and so forth to operationalize this. So we've been building these things in a number of contexts. So the future, let's facilitate curiosity and wonder. Um, let's help people learn and discover and leverage things in the past. Let's be more understanding of people all around the world. Uh, collaborate, help people be both specialized and, and uh, able to have synergies through synthesis not just meet short-term goals, but long-term goals and remember our history and build on things from the past, as, as I alluded to. Tailoring to groups of people, to personas, as well as to personalization for individuals and cover the, the full information life cycle. So this is what we talked about and uh, time for some questions. There's, a, there's two publications coming up momentarily. Um, the, First one is a longer version of what I said today and also spoke of briefly at JCDL last, last year. The other one, I'm editor, executive editor, editor of a new journal and the first issue is going to have a, a talk about how to apply this in the context of electronic theses and dissertations. So I'm done. Thank you so much for your patience and your uh, interest and keep up the great work. <laughs>